Good afternoon. I'm Rick Lifton, the president of Rockefeller University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our virtual discussions with genuine experts. If you think back to when we last met, we we're just beginning to come out of a major wave of uh, infection from uh, with COVID-19 in the winter, and vaccines were just starting to be rolled out. And uh, there was a sense of optimism that uh, we might be finally getting our hands around uh, this pandemic uh, and might be able to emerge from it. A few things have happened along the way that have uh, slowed down uh, our progress. Uh, and here we are seven months later uh, in the midst of uh, a Delta wave, uh, another of the variant uh, viruses. What I want to do this afternoon is give you an overview of where we are in the current pandemic. And then we will uh, have uh, another discussion with uh, Paul Benash, one of the world's experts on, on COVID uh, research, who will tell us uh, a little more about uh, in answers to uh, your questions about where we are and uh, what the path forward uh, is going to look like. So I will begin by uh, sharing my screen and uh, giving you an overview uh, of uh, where things are now. So shown here is uh, the daily uh, uh, global uh, list of, uh, uh, on a daily basis, uh, the new infections and uh, daily deaths uh, related to COVID. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is where we were back in January and February, and we had this steep decline. Vaccines were rolling out. We thought uh, maybe this was going to be the end of the pandemic. And then this amazing surge uh, came in the spring and uh, rolled on into uh, uh, May, and then was uh, followed by a steep decline again, only to be followed by another wave uh, this summer. And uh, deaths have uh, largely uh, uh, paralleled uh, that uh, as well. So uh, we currently have uh, uh, been in the midst of uh, this latest wave. And uh, the reason for this uh, was the emergence of the Delta variant, uh, which uh, began in India and is now spread across the world and uh, is the, concept, the cause of uh, the current wave. So uh, if you uh, think about you know, where we are globally, uh, this is the global map uh, that the New York Times, which, who has done a, a wonderful job of reporting throughout uh, the pandemic, uh, we now are at 225 million uh, cases uh, worldwide, more than 4,600,000 deaths worldwide, and we're currently clocking at about uh, 570,000 cases per day uh, and uh, nearly 9,000 deaths per day, a terrible toll uh, on the human population. And so when you look across the world at where we are here at um, September 13th, uh, you can see by the darkest colors uh, that we are among the list of the most severely affected uh, countries uh, uh, on the planet. Uh, and uh, we're rivaled by a few, uh, the UK, uh, Israel, uh, Mongolia, Malaysia, uh, and a few others uh, have very high levels uh, like us, uh, but uh, we are among the uh, uh, highest infection rates uh, uh, on the planet uh, uh, right now. We had talked about the vaccines and the vaccines have been rolled out uh, uh, across uh, not just the United States, but across the world. Initially, we were wondering how many doses could we get out in the course of the year? And uh, uh, when we last met, uh, it was entirely unclear how fast the world would be able to scale up uh, with uh, vaccines that uh, are useful. And it's turned out that uh, a lot more vaccine has been produced, uh, delivered, and administered than I think most of us uh, uh, figured on back then. To date, 5.7 billion doses have now been administered, enough to uh, fully vaccinate about 30% uh, of the world's population. Uh, which is truly remarkable. This is no longer a, uh, a US-centric uh, vaccination uh, effort. In fact, because of resistance to get vaccinated, uh, we are not even close to being among the most highly vaccinated countries uh, in the world. Uh, our neighbor to the north, Canada, uh, virtually all countries uh, in Western Europe, uh, as well as China and many other uh, countries have higher rates of vaccination uh, than we do uh, here in the United States. 
We currently, as of today, are about 54% of all people in the United States uh, have been vaccinated uh, with higher fractions of uh, uh, the adult population. As you know, we have uh, vaccines approved for everybody over uh, age 12 now. Uh, unfortunately, the 12 to 18 group uh, is only uh, only about 38 percent of uh, those individuals have uh, been vac fully vaccinated uh, in the United States. Uh, that's a significant problem, but also as a problem is uh, in, even in the adult population, uh, we are far from uh, uh, reaching complete uh, uh, vaccination. We have done the best in those over age uh, 65, uh, which I think has uh, proved to uh, be an IQ test. Uh, people uh, over age 65 are the most vulnerable uh, to uh, hospitalization and death from uh, COVID. Uh, and that population, not surprisingly, uh, is the most vaccinated. Shown in the upper left here uh, is how we do in the US on uh, the over 65, 83% are fully vaccinated. Uh, and uh, uh, in the over age 18, 65%. And when you get to 12 and up, uh, it drops to 63%. And this group, as I said, uh, are uh, the least vaccinated group. Uh, but uh, everybody be below age 12 remains unvaccinated now, uh, which constitutes a major problem as we look forward to uh, the school year, uh, which has already begun in much of uh, the country and just uh, school opened in New York uh, just yesterday in the public schools. So <clears throat> this shows the uh, number of vaccine doses delivered uh, each day. We hit a high of uh, uh, several million a day and then it dropped off and got quite low. But when the Delta variant started uh, emerging in the population, uh, there was a return to getting vaccinated and we've been averaging about 900,000 uh, doses a day uh, for the last several weeks. There's a fascinating uh, distribution of the states that have the highest and lowest uh, uh, rates of vaccination. Uh, on the right-hand side here, we see uh, everybody who, the, the fraction of uh, each st state's population uh, over 18 who have had at least one dose of vaccine. And if you take uh, the very highest uh, states, uh, we range from uh, in the high 80s uh, down to the low 80s. This is, uh, I think, the uh, top 18 or 16 or 18 uh, states in the uh, U.S. Uh, and, at, and so we, this gets down to about 80% uh, in this group. Uh, and on the low end of the least vaccinated states uh, in, uh, in the uh, U.S., uh, this gets down into the 50s. So there's a drastic difference between uh, states going from very high uh, levels of uh, uh, vaccine to very low levels of vaccine. And uh, as one of our trustees uh, pointed out to me, if you look at uh, uh, these two lists, uh, you will note uh, that one list uh, exclusively voted uh, uh, for Joe Biden and the other list exclusively voted for Donald Trump uh, in the last uh, election. Uh, this indicates, uh, I think, unfortunately, a terrible polarization and politicization of uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, which is not working to uh, the benefit uh, of our population. Uh, we have many people who uh, are unvaccinated, uh, and they tend to uh, be clustered in particular states uh, in this country. And I'll come back to uh, the consequences uh, of that. Importantly, <clears throat> these vaccines have turned out to be very safe, not just in the initial clinical trials of 30,000 people, uh, but in the general population in real world uh, use. Uh, so this slide shows uh, adverse effect, uh, uh, effect events within uh, seven weeks of vaccination, six weeks of vaccination uh, in nearly a million people uh, compared to people, to matched individuals who did not get vaccinated, as well as to uh, another population of individuals who were matched for age and demographics uh, who had natural infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And <clears throat> there's a range of uh, uh, events that uh, are reported, but when you compare them to uh, uh, unvaccinated matched uh, individuals who have not been infected, uh, most of these end up having negligible effects. So this is the number of events per 100,000 uh, people. And uh, there are a few events that uh, are uh, increased in people who get vaccinated. 
One is uh, lymphadenopathy, enlargement of the lymph nodes, uh, typically in proximity to where the uh, vaccine was administered. That's significantly higher than in the unvaccinated population, uh, and that's uh, no surprise. Myocarditis, uh, inflammation of the heart, which usually is uh, self-limited uh, to a couple of weeks, uh, and with rest, uh, people recover and don't seem to have uh, uh, long-term consequences. Uh, there are about three more cases per 100,000 individuals uh, than uh, expected uh, by chance. So uh, this tends to occur in younger males, uh, but is a relatively uncommon uh, event. Interestingly, if you get natural infection, you actually have a higher rate of developing uh, myocarditis. Uh, there are a few other non-significant uh, uh, and relatively uh, rare uh, uh, adverse events. One of the most interesting, which I think was unanticipated prior to this study, uh, is uh, reactivation of uh, herpes zoster. Uh, this is the chicken pox. After we get infected, the virus remains dormant uh, uh, in uh, uh, neurons in our body. And uh, uh, surprisingly, this turns out to uh, occasionally become reactivated, 16 cases uh, per 100,000 more than expected uh, uh, by chance. But most of these others are uh, really de minimis and uh, uh, not significant. Uh, another that occurs is appendicitis, which occurs at about the same rate if you get infected. Importantly, in addition to risk of severe disease, hospitalization, and death from COVID, vac uh, uh, from COVID infection, uh, there are many other adverse events uh, that uh, accompany COVID uh, infection uh, that are uh, vastly worse than what we see in people who get vaccinated. Acute kidney uh, uh, injury with uh, progressive uh, renal failure, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. Uh, these are all drastically enriched in people who get uh, uh, infected with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So these vaccines, uh, in addition to uh, uh, being uh, efficacious, as I'll show you subsequently, uh, are very safe. And this has been very important uh, in uh, persuading people that it is in their interest uh, to get the vaccine. Pregnancy has been a serious uh, consideration. If I'm thinking of having a baby or am pregnant, should I get vaccinated? Uh, everybody uh, who has looked at the data seriously, including uh, the American Academy of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecology, uh, as well as the CDC, say yes. Uh, it is both safe and uh, uh, can be life-saving uh, to get vaccinated if uh, you are pregnant. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a study that looked at 706 women uh, who were pregnant uh, and women, uh, twice as many individuals who were uh, not pregnant uh, during the same period uh, matched for age and uh, demographics. And uh, in the red boxes, so the two uh, highlights, uh, there's about a five-fold increased risk of uh, uh, if you uh, are infected with uh, COVID-19, of uh, ending up uh, being admitted to the ICU if you are pregnant compared to if you are not pregnant. And uh, there's about a 22-fold increased risk uh, of dying if uh, you are pregnant uh, uh, and uh, have not been vaccinated and are infected uh, with uh, COVID-19. So these are very strong reasons uh, to get vaccinated uh, if you are thinking about getting pregnant or are pregnant. There have been similar uh, studies that have looked at uh, uh, miscarriage uh, uh, and spontaneous abortion in uh, women who become pregnant uh, and are vaccinated and there is no evidence uh, that there's any impairment in either fertility or, or increased risk of uh, spontaneous abortion uh, if you uh, have been or get vaccinated uh, during pregnancy. So the <clears throat> big event uh, uh, since we last met uh, was the emergence of the Delta variant. And uh, this uh, first emerged in India and took off like wildfire. Uh, India had had uh, relatively uh, mild uh, 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 episodes of COVID. Uh, as you know, it's an extremely large company, country over a billion people. Uh, they had uh, reached a peak previously of 100,000 cases a day. Uh, and then that had gone down. And then in uh, beginning in March, and then progressing up into May, hit a peak of nearly 400,000 cases uh, per day. 
Uh, their death rate uh, climbed as well uh, to new heights, uh, peaking at over 4,000 uh, deaths per day. So this uh, reason for this, uh, Delta turns out to be much more transmissible than the original version of the coronavirus. So the original coronavirus is thought to uh, have an R0, the number of people that uh, uh, the virus uh, spreads to, uh, around two to three. The, the Delta variant is more transmissible uh, with a transmission rate of uh, five to eight uh, as a, a reasonable estimates. This puts it in the range of highly infectious uh, viruses uh, such as chickenpox uh, and uh, higher than smallpox, uh, polio, uh, and the original SARS uh, virus. This is a very transmissible uh, uh, virus that uh, is capable of uh, infecting many more people than uh, the original strain of the virus. Uh, and this is a major cause of why this has uh, spread so rapidly across the world and has also outcompeted other variants that have been circulating in the population and has rapidly taken over virtually every country uh, in which uh, it has been uh, introduced, uh, which now is almost all of the countries uh, around the world. So what are the variants uh, in the virus that make it uh, so transmissible? Well, we, we're not exactly sure what the mechanisms are, but here are the amino acid substitutions that are changed from the original uh, variant uh, to what is seen in the Delta virus. And these uh, shown here are all of the variants that have been found more than once in, in, in independent isolates of uh, the virus. So this is the Delta variant. The previous, uh, the alpha variant that came out of the UK, uh, beta from South Africa, uh, gamma originally isolated uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, and there are a number of variants that show up again and again. For example, these are all in the spike protein and a substitution uh, of an original uh, aspartate uh, to uh, glycine substitution at position 614 is seen in virtually every uh, subsequent uh, isolate. So this is a very common one, another uh, substitution at uh, position 501, uh, and then another that uh, emerged in, independently in South Africa and Brazil, uh, a substitution of uh, 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 lysine for glutamate uh, at position 484 occurred. Uh, and this has uh, been thought to be a very bad uh, uh, actor. And it was thought that this was likely to show up in every uh, subsequent uh, uh, variant. And then Delta came along, did not have that variant, and instead had another variant uh, that had not been seen before, except in uh, the UK strain and a couple of others, uh, a substitution at position 681, that substituted, uh, uh, in this case, arginine for proline residue. It had been seen previously uh, with a histidine substitution, but the arginine had not been seen previously. And this turns out, uh, to it's thought, and we'll talk about this subsequently with Paul, to be one of the major uh, drivers of why Delta is so infectious. And uh, the reason for that turns out to be quite uh, interesting. While we're on this page, there have been successors to Delta that uh, people have been worried about and are variants of uh, concern. Uh, one of these is uh, mu, and mu has a related variant, uh, the histidine substitution, not the arginine seen in delta, uh, but it does have the uh, E484K variant, uh, which is shared among many of the uh, most highly infectious uh, viruses uh, prior to uh, delta. So these shared mutations uh, are there because they confer uh, in some way increased uh, ability of the virus uh, to transmit itself for uh, any of a number of reasons, either greater access to getting into cells, better ability to replicate uh, once they're in cells, or better ability to evade the immune system. So I'll come back to uh, these questions. So <clears throat> these are the changes in the Delta uh, variant and one of its successors, Kappa. Kappa has this substitution. This is the spike protein. This is the ACE2 receptor. Uh, this is only seen in Kappa, not in Delta. 
The variant that seems to be uh, one of the major drivers of Delta is this uh, P681 uh, R substitution that occurs well away from where uh, the receptor, the uh, spike protein interacts uh, with its receptor. And there's interesting biology that uh, I've alluded to. So here we were coming down from our peak last winter in the United States, everything looking good. There was a bump in the spring as everybody started getting excited about the good weather and going out uh, unprotected. Uh, but we recovered from that and everything was looking great. Uh, we had uh, uh, very low levels uh, in May and June, uh, down to lower levels than we had had even the previous summer. Uh, and then starting in July, uh, things really took off and uh, has climbed back up to uh, now around oh, today uh, 170,000 cases uh, in the last uh, uh, average over the last uh, seven days. And we're back up uh, over 1,500 uh, deaths per day. Uh, and we now have a total of 41 million cases uh, in the United States since the start of the pandemic and more than 660,000 uh, deaths. Uh, it's sobering uh, just having uh, uh, gone through the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks to realize that every two days we are losing more people in the United States from COVID uh, than we did from the 9-11 uh, attacks. So again, as we've uh, seen before, the distribution of cases is uh, not even across uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, as uh, the Delta uh, uh, pandemic has uh, emerged. Uh, the South ended up being a major focus, uh, starting uh, it actually in the Midwest in uh, uh, Missouri, uh, but then subsequently spreading uh, to Louisiana and Texas, uh, and then Florida. Uh, and uh, things have emerged, for, converged from there, spreading north uh, through Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, and now Tennessee is uh, really on fire, uh, an average uh, of 160 cases per 100,000 population, uh, newly infected uh, every day, uh, and uh, continuing to spread through Kentucky and uh, West Virginia, Ohio and Indiana. And the major question uh, with the course of the pandemic uh, is, uh, will this continue to spread and come up into the Northeast uh, and into uh, uh, the Midwest, the Northern Midwest? Uh, or uh, have we seen our peak and uh, we'll, can, we'll be able to uh, uh, hold off uh, further intrusion of uh, uh, the virus into the Northeast? And this is a, a big unknown question, uh, particularly relevant uh, as school is starting and the threat of spread uh, coming from uh, infections uh, in uh, classrooms in the school uh, become a major issue. New York City has followed uh, ostensibly the same curve, got down to wonderfully low levels uh, in June. Uh, things looked so promising. Uh, and then we've uh, had recrudescence uh, and uh, hit a peak of uh, over 2,000 uh, cases uh, per day, now down uh, somewhere around 1,700 uh, uh, cases per day, coming down somewhat slowly, but making some progress. Fortunately, the death rate has uh, been much lower uh, and we have not gone back to uh, uh, terribly high death uh, rates, averaging about 13 deaths per day uh, in New York City. Uh, but the total toll uh, in New York uh, has obviously been uh, devastating. And these case numbers, as uh, you know, are likely uh, an underestimate because there are so many asymptomatic uh, uh, cases. Here at Rockefeller, <clears throat> we followed uh, exactly the same pattern as the rest of uh, New York City. We've had uh, uh, relatively few cases, but because we're sampling through Bob Darnell's uh, uh, saliva test, we're testing everybody on campus every week. Uh, and uh, we've captured uh, many, many uh, asymptomatic cases or pre-symptomatic cases, uh, people who were asymptomatic uh, when diagnosed, gotten off campus, uh, therefore, they don't spread the disease to others. And throughout the pandemic, uh, we have had uh, uh, precisely one uh, case of uh, transmission from an infected person to another infected person uh, on campus. So getting back to the key question of uh, do these vaccines uh, work? And there are many lines of evidence uh, that they do. Uh, one simple uh, way of looking at it is if we take the uh, states with the highest uh, uh, rate of full vaccination, and uh, these are the states, 
uh, and they range from 68% uh, fully vaccinated to 61%, uh, with the average in the United States being 54%. So this is a highly vaccinated uh, population. And we can see uh, their uh, death rate per 100,000 uh, ranges uh, from about uh, 0.1 per 100,000 per day uh, to about 0.4 per 100,000 per day. Uh, and their case uh, rates are uh, uh, average in the 20s. Uh, and the rate of hospitalization uh, is in the teens. In contrast, if you take the population with the lowest vaccination rates, all below 54%, around 40 to 43%, uh, they have much higher uh, rates of uh, death, rates of hospitalization, uh, and uh, uh, rates of new infections. And here's a summary of uh, this data. The most vaccinated states uh, compared to the least vaccinated states, there's about a three-fold difference, three to four-fold difference uh, in deaths, uh, mean hospitalizations, uh, and uh, case numbers uh, are much greater as well. So that's good in, uh, evidence. Uh, better evidence comes from a study just published this uh, uh, weekend uh, by the CDC. Uh, this shows a, a study uh, covering April through uh, the end of July. Uh, which is a relevant time period because this is when uh, the Delta variant started coming into the population. And you can see the case numbers uh, in uh, unvaccinated and case numbers in vaccinated individuals. And you can see that case numbers came down and then went up in the unvaccinated individuals uh, and they were already down and got down further and have come up uh, a bit. It's about a, uh, an 80% uh, reduction in, in, in new infections in people uh, who are uh, vaccinated. Uh, and this is in the period, this uh, from uh, uh, the end of June through the end of July, uh, this is the period in which uh, Delta became the predominant uh, uh, virus in the population uh, across the country. Most importantly, you can see that hospitalizations went way up uh, in the unvaccinated uh, population, but did not budge much at all in the vaccinated population. And this is about a 90% uh, protection rate uh, from hospitalization uh, in, uh, uh, this po in these populations. And the death rate similarly is drastically biased uh, in favor of the vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people. Uh, again, uh, more than a 90% uh, reduction in death uh, in uh, populations uh, that are vaccinated uh, compared to those that are unvaccinated. So uh, from this data, you can see that there's tremendous protection from severe disease. Not such strong, but still very significant protection uh, from uh, getting primary infection. And uh, this is something that uh, is important as we think about uh, booster shots. So what is it that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is enabling the uh, Delta variant to infect people uh, better than pre previous uh, uh, vaccines? Well, one uh, factor that is likely to play a role uh, is uh, waning antibody levels. And these were first uh, uh, demonstrated uh, by the Rockefeller group with uh, Paul Benash and Michelle uh, Nussenzweig and colleagues, who showed that uh, a month after vaccination, uh, this was the level of antibody. And on this log scale, six months uh, after vaccination, uh, it had dropped by uh, about a factor of five. There's a five-fold lower neutralizing antibodies uh, in the plasma of people uh, after natural infection. Uh, so if you got infected, you initially have very high levels of uh, immunity, and that wanes uh, significantly over a period of months. And interestingly, the people who started out with the highest had the biggest drop in uh, antibody levels. Uh, this applies as well to uh, uh, vaccination and uh, studies of both the Pfizer as well as the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines show that uh, I, this is the number of days after uh, completion of uh, vaccination. Uh, you hit a peak uh, and then that peak uh, begins waning uh, over time in a similar fashion to what you see uh, after uh, natural infection. 
So this suggested that uh, uh, these neutralizing antibodies correlate very well with uh, uh, rate of infection uh, and suggested that this would account for uh, increased rates of uh, infection uh, with time after uh, a either natural infection uh, or uh, immunization. And this raised the question of whether uh, boosters uh, might make a difference. And so uh, there have been uh, several studies of these and uh, the most comprehensive of, of these, although a short study uh, was done in Israel in collaboration uh, with Pfizer. Uh, and uh, this was a, a very careful study, but of very short duration. But they took, uh, uh, groups of patients who were matched uh, for demographics, age, uh, et cetera. And one group uh, did not get uh, a booster shot and the other group uh, did get a booster shot, a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And then they followed these uh, uh, several hundred thousand people uh, for about 12 days uh, after they were uh, uh, beyond the uh, third dose of the vaccine. And they looked at uh, confirmed infections and uh, uh, severe COVID. And what they found was that there was a marked difference uh, in the rate of uh, new infections as well as severe disease in those who got the third dose of the booster compared to those who did not. This was over 90% protection uh, against either primary infection or against uh, severe illness. Uh, and this is an important study, uh, certainly not uh, uh, the final answer, but uh, it was uh, sufficient for uh, uh, Israel to commit, which they had to, uh, uh, to getting, uh, uh, doing this at the national scale and is now under debate uh, in the United States. The major debate in the US, as you might imagine, is, uh, well, the, as I showed on the previous slide, the current vaccines are doing an extremely good job of preventing uh, hospitalization and death. Uh, sh is it worth giving uh, the booster shots? And of course, the, one of the questions is what value do you put on uh, the reduced infection rate? Uh, if uh, it's, you know, the, it's, you can say, well, you're preventing severe disease, which is what the goal of uh, uh, vaccination is. But another goal of vaccination is to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, and if indeed you could uh, reduce an individual's ability to get infected and then pass it on, uh, you might have a marked effect to attenuate uh, the pandemic. And this is currently being debated uh, as to whether the US will go ahead with uh, 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 giving booster shots. Another major issue that uh, has come up uh, in particular as we are now uh, in school opening uh, season is uh, children with uh, and their risk for getting uh, COVID. As I've mentioned, and as you know, uh, children old, younger than age 12 uh, are not currently authorized to uh, get vaccinated uh, because of concerns about uh, uh, safety and efficacy. Uh, and yet, uh, over the last uh, month, there has been a marked increase in the number of uh, uh, individuals being under 18 who are being hospitalized uh, uh, with COVID. That number has gone up uh, quite dramatically, but it's also gone up in the context of everybody else in the population having increased risk uh, as well. So the fraction of uh, individuals who are uh, being hospitalized uh, who are under 18 uh, remains only about 1.6% uh, uh, 1.6 uh, per 100,000 population. Uh, and this is much lower than individuals uh, over age 70 who uh, are more at the, uh, in the range of 15 uh, per 100,000 uh, becoming uh, hospitalized. So um, this is nonetheless uh, a, a large population and all of these uh, unvaccinated children under age 12 who are uh, going to elementary school uh, now are in a vulnerable uh, position. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will be seeing uh, approval of for, uh, for emergency use authorization uh, for vaccines for children under uh, age 12 uh, in the coming uh, perhaps two months. So lastly, I want to uh, give you an update on uh, research on COVID uh, at uh, Rockefeller. 
Uh, it has been a remarkable uh, hive of activity here on campus and uh, the contributions coming from Rockefeller to uh, uh, COVID has really been uh, extraordinary. Uh, monoclonal antibodies that have been developed here at Rockefeller are uh, uh, in clinical trials. Uh, they are uh, uh, the most potent antibodies. It's likely that uh, uh, they will be very successful uh, in uh, preventing and treating uh, patients with uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, they have to be given uh, early in the course of infection like other monoclonal antibodies. Major advantage of these is they can be given as two subcutaneous in uh, uh, injections. The current uh, antibodies are hard to uh, deliver because they're less potent. They need four injections, including a couple in the abdomen. Uh, they're not great. Uh, some recent uh, uh, paper that uh, should soon to be published, uh, it's been picked up in the press uh, about superhuman immunity, and I'll come back to talk about that with uh, Paul Benash. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, study of the evolution of the antibody response and the immune memory uh, in uh, COVID. Uh, there's been development of bispecific antibodies, antibodies that hit two different epitopes uh, that give the uh, superior binding and have potential to uh, 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 overcome some of the resistance to uh, some of the antibodies that has emerged uh, in the population. Uh, uh, Jean-Laurent Casanova has identified uh, mutations and acquired uh, loss of interferon in patients with severe disease. A paper uh, just recently published in uh, uh, Science uh, Immunity demonstrated that uh, there are antibodies to type 1 interferons that are found uh, in up to 20% of patients uh, who have severe disease. Uh, Work here at uh, Rockefeller uh, by uh, Tarun Kapoor and uh, Tom Tushel uh, has been uh, uh, trying to identify small molecules that uh, uh, attack novel viral targets uh, that uh, may be oral uh, direct acting antiviral agents, uh, and they have promising leads for uh, a number of these targets. Charlie Rice, building upon his prior experience uh, I, that led to his Nobel Prize, uh, for hepatitis C uh, has been uh, building subgenomic replicons for SARS-CoV-2, uh, enabling you to uh, directly try to interfere with replication of the virus uh, in cells without having a live virus in cells that you're studying, uh, which is how uh, the cure for uh, hepatitis C was developed. Uh, Bob Darnell has continued to uh, streamline viral testing protocols uh, and uh, a number of studies out of Rockefeller have looked at uh, nanobodies uh, that uh, uh, are these very tiny, uh, just uh, antibody binding uh, uh, parts uh, that don't have, that are very small and can get into parts of molecules that might not otherwise be accessible. Uh, and these have identified some uh, potentially novel viral epitopes that might be targeted uh, for uh, preventative use. So there's a tremendous amount of activity going on here. Uh, there have been 16 papers published in the world's leading scientific journals, Science, Nature, Cell, and the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, along with a total of 75 papers altogether uh, from uh, Rockefeller investigators. And I think it's a, a truly remarkable uh, body of work uh, that they have contributed that has really informed us uh, about much of uh, uh, this pandemic. So now uh, it's uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce, reintroduce you to uh, Paul Benash. Uh, so uh, Paul is uh, one of the great virologists uh, here at uh, uh, Rockefeller or anywhere uh, on the planet. And uh, I educated in England, uh, Paul came to the United States uh, in 1996 uh, and uh, was recruited ultimately to the faculty here at Rockefeller uh, and in 2010 was promoted to professor. And he's been a leader originally in HIV research, uh, identifying mechanisms by which uh, HIV overcomes cellular defenses. Uh, and, but uh, he and his partner, uh, Theodora uh, Hatsianu, expanded uh, the possibilities of uh, HIV research by creating altered forms of HIV that can be used in animal models to accurately mirror infection uh, in humans. Uh, they've developed increasingly sophisticated techniques to manipulate viral genomes. 
And consequently, when the COVID pandemic uh, came about, uh, they were extremely well prepared and quickly pivoted to apply their expertise to the study of COVID. So Paul anticipated early on the emergence of resistance variants uh, to uh, COVID, and uh, they have done much of the work uh, both predicting which variants are going to uh, emerge uh, and uh, how well the uh, existing vaccines and antibodies uh, would uh, work on these. So uh, his group was characterizing and analyzing lab uh, character, uh, generated variants in the spike protein uh, long before nature uh, produced uh, these variants uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. He's been collaborating closely with Charlie Rice and uh, Michelle uh, Nussenswag uh, and have done uh, quite remarkable uh, work uh, throughout the pandemic. So now I, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Paul. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're delighted to have you here to uh, uh, share your expertise uh, with us yet again. Uh, regrettably that uh, this is uh, necessary. Perhaps I'll, I'll start uh, by asking you to tell us what it is about uh, the mutations in the Delta virus uh, that makes it uh, such a formidable uh, version of the virus. Right. Well, Hello, Rick. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to be with you. And what what might be peculiar about uh, Delta is that it has um, sort of a collection of mutations that that probably do more than more than one thing. Um, so we had previously encountered variants uh, such as such as Alpha, which. Uh, for example, had the had the mutations, the the proline mutation um, at position six hundred and eighty one, that we we suspect is a um, a fitness enhancing mutation makes the virus better able to transmit between individuals. We'd seen those types of variants before, and alpha was typical of those. We'd also seen a variant such as beta that came from um, South Africa, which didn't seem to be very much more transmissible, but had a, a, a high degree of antibody resistance, um, such that the, the uh, pre-existing immunity in people who had been infected previously or had been vaccinated wasn't quite as effective. What Delta seems to do is to combine those two properties. So it has uh, both of both these sort of virus replication enhancing mutations and also a degree of um, resistance to antibodies. Um, while we don't know for sure, what we suspect has been happening during, um, I suppose, the second half of the uh, pandemic, thinking of the pandemic as solely as what, what's, uh, what's gone before today, is that these variants have really risen to the fore in the latter part of the pandemic, really as levels of immunity from infection primarily, but then more recently from vaccination have mounted. And if you think about a chain of transmission as virus passes from one person to another to another, that happens every few days. Um, and so every, just about every possible transmission chain has in it people who have previously been infected. Once infection levels have gotten up to the sort of 25% level as they have in many pl places in the world. So my suspicion is that Delta has both this intrinsic ability to pass between people who have no immunity, but also on top of that has this um, partial immune evasion property. And I think that's what, what has really given it the edge um, um, in recent months. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about the biochemistry of, of what is it uh, about these mutations that uh, enable them to uh, uh, replicate, uh, give them a replicative advantage. So, so only some of that is known, actually. And um, in the case of the, the immune evasion mutations, the, the, the mutations that cause partial resistance to antibodies, that's 
fairly straightforward. The antibodies bind to particular places on the spike protein. Um, there are a number, probably a quite large number of different places on the spike to which the antibodies can bind. And by making mutations in those binding sites, to, it essentially reduces the, the degree to which those antibodies combine and thereby reduces their effectiveness. The other mutations are more difficult. We, we I don't think, have extremely good model systems in the laboratory to, to mimic the selective forces that um, underlie transmissibility in the real world. Um, the particular mutation that you referred to, um, P681R or H in some variants, we know something about that. That mutation happens to be uh, very close to a particular site in the spike protein, uh, the so-called furin cleavage site. It's, it's a part of the um, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that's a little unusual in um, this family of viruses, the Sarbeco viruses. And what happens is as the virus is being made, the, the spike protein is loaded onto the virus as the uh, it proceeds through the secretory pathway out of the cell. And there's a, a protease called furin that cuts the spike protein at that point. The whole thing stays together, but this little nick in the, in the spike protein um, seems to reduce the, um, the sort of the energetic barrier that's required for subsequent steps in the virus life cycle. After the virus has left the cell, it then goes on to attach to and enter a new cell. And that entry process involves lots of molecular gymnastics of the spike protein. Um, there are additional cuts are made to it. Uh, it inserts part of it into the target cell. Um, these are all, um, um, these all require changes in the shape of the spike protein that seem to be somewhat facilitated by this cleavage event. And that proline to P2R or P2H change at position 681 just increases the, the ease with which furin can make that cut. That's really the closest we have to pinning down a, a mechanistic basis for increased replication and fitness. So as these variants have emerged, there has been a lot of uh, discussion about whether the existing vaccines are up to the challenge of these uh, new variants. Uh, and yet we seem to be getting along uh, pretty well uh, with uh, fighting off uh, these new variants uh, with the existing vaccinations. What are your thoughts about uh, where we are and whether it will eventually be necessary uh, for us to use new uh, uh, vaccines that are tailored to the specific variants that uh, are in the population at the time? Yeah, so th this, is, um, this is both very interesting and very tricky to predict. So, um, that, let's, let's begin again by imagining this, the spike protein being attacked at many different places by antibodies. Uh, and what some of these variants have been able to do is to change those antibody binding sites uh, such that some of those antibodies no longer attach to and neutralize the virus. Um, but what we and others have found, um, particularly recently, is that we're getting a better handle on what the number of those sites that antibodies can attach to are and how many of them have been uh, essentially taken off the table by the mutations that occur in variants. And, and what, what we're sort of finding is that there's still plenty of residual uh, activity of the, um, the immune responses that are elicited by the original strain vaccines, okay? Um, they make a, a wide range of antibodies and the variants haven't yet learned to evade all of them. That's one part of it. The other part of it is, is that we're also learning, and this is based on fundamental um, 
immunological principles is that as people are immunized, um, particularly as their immune responses mature, um, the antibodies seem to get better with time, okay? They are able to cope um, with um, the variants that the virus throws, throws up to try and avoid these antibodies. So if you can imagine the, the antibodies that are elicited, for example, by um, a single dose of vaccine, um, they can bind to the viral spike protein, but the viral spike protein can quite easily evade those antibodies by making a mutation in the antibody binding site. What happens over time is the, the B cells making those antibodies evolve and they make antibodies that bind a lot tighter to the virus. And so the effects of those mutations are diminished. Uh, those effects of those mutations in terms of avoiding the antibodies uh, are diminished. So we're really in sort of an arms race, as it were, bet between our immune systems and the virus. And while the virus has gained some ground recently, it's still very much the case that our, our immune systems are ahead at present. Now, that's not going to be the case forever. Um, at some point in the future, if we don't change the vaccines, the virus will catch up and, and overtake the vaccines. The vaccines will, in a sense, become irrelevant. But we're, we're clearly not there yet. And I've, my suspicion is there's quite a long way to go before we reach that point. On a related topic, uh, you uh, have recently hit the airwaves with uh, this uh, fascinating observation that uh, there's a difference in the immune response from natural infection uh, compared to uh, vaccination with uh, <clears throat> some uh, calling it uh, superhuman immunity to uh, if you've had natural infection followed by uh, vaccination. Uh, what is it that uh, is happening there that uh, makes that kind of immunity so particularly effective? Yes. So I should I should very quickly say that the term superhuman immunity did not come from <laughs> us. That that was a journalist's uh, interpretation of our work. I would wouldn't dream of uh, using such a term in a sober scientific uh, publication. But basically, what that what that um, study showed is that people who had been infected early in the pandemic, so New Yorkers that came to Rockefeller, volunteered to donate their blood to, um, from which we cloned antibodies. Uh, with Michelle, um, we've been following those people for, for over 18 months now. Um, so those early infected people were all infected with a, um, the original strain. No, very little variation was present at that time. Um, we followed them. And then between uh, six and 12 months after we started following them, a portion of them uh, had the opportunity to be vaccinated. And they, they received the, the mRNA vaccines. And as, as you showed in your talk, what, what we had also found is that the immunity in those originally infected people had been waning over months. Um, the levels of antibody had been waning. Important to recognize, though, that even though the levels of antibody had been going down, their antibodies had still been evolving. They had been still learning to bind tighter and tighter to the spike protein that originally uh, drove the elicitation of those antibodies. Now, what seems to have happened is after the sort of the six to 12 months uh, that those antibodies had both been evolving, but decreasing in levels, if you then come and give them uh, mRNA vaccines, those antibodies are very strongly boosted, okay? They go from low levels to extraordinarily high levels. Um, not only are they uh, very high levels, but they have also, through this evolutionary process, learned to cope with uh, many of the variants, uh, just simply by binding tighter and tighter to the original sequence. And what we find is that the collections of antibodies that are in the blood of these people that were infected, then vaccinated, just with the original strains, they have 
both incredible potency and also remarkable breadth. Not only can they quite well neutralize all of the SARS-CoV-2 variants that we have been able to get our hands on, they're also pretty good at neutralizing the original SARS coronavirus and a number of related viruses that are in bats and pangolins, uh, some whose sequences are really quite different to, to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so this, this, I think, tells us that neither original infection nor the vaccines that we have, though very effective, they have in no way come close to exhausting the capacity of the human immune system to mount defense against this virus. And it's partly for that reason that I think I'm more enthusiastic than most about the prospects of, of boosting to uh, build on what you showed in that Israeli study to, to really um, put more pressure on the, on the virus to um, really curtail the spread if we can just get people to take those shots. So you think then that uh, it's possible that uh, three doses, a, th a third dose of the same vaccine will give you uh, a greater breadth and maybe longer lasting immunity than we've had from the first two doses? I, I there are the first studies of that specific regime, three shots of mRNA with the third one months after the first two, those studies are beginning to come out now. And while they while that immunity isn't quite as good, we don't think, as the um, infection followed by vaccination, it clearly has some of the same properties in terms of being able to deal with breadth and also giving uh, very high levels of antibodies. And perhaps most encouragingly of all, the, the rate of decline that you see after the third shot seems to be lower than the rate of the decline after the second shot. And ultimately, um, I think what we will be transitioning to is thinking of these mRNA vaccines as three dose vaccines, as many other uh, viral vaccines are, rather than two dose vaccines. Uh, the two doses was, was always um, sort of a, um, a pragmatic uh, solution to a, a, a global pandemic to get these things out as quickly as possible. But there are, there are well-founded immunological principles that would lead one to think that a third shot, a boost of a matured antibody response would be better and longer lasting than a, than a two-shot vaccine. Great. I want to turn to uh, your thoughts about the opening of the school year here in New York and uh, across the country, where we have millions of children going to school uh, uh, unvaccinated uh, every day. Uh, and uh, not to be facetious, but uh, you know, the question, what could go wrong, uh, comes to mind. Uh, and I'm interested in your thoughts about uh, how you what, what advice you would give to parents and how you see uh, things playing out over the next several months? Yes. Well, in a sense, I'm be giving advice to myself because I have a, a middle schooler and uh, my daughter and my son who's just started at Bronx Science. They went, went to school for the first time in 18 months uh, yesterday. And to be frank, I am a little worried um, that they are both vaccinated, of course, um, but some of their friends are not. Um, it is they're wearing masks all day, but social distancing in a school setting, a New York school setting, isn't six feet. It's three feet. Um, there's a weak spot, which is during lunchtime. Uh, the kids take off their masks um, to eat lunch. Um, they're traveling on the subway. Um, really, we're doing a big experiment in the effectiveness of these partial mitigations against um, viral spread. The other part of this that gives me great concern is the, is the vaccination rate in New York as a whole. Um, um, while you accurately pointed out that there's variation uh, among the states. There's also great variation within New York City. And in Brooklyn and the Bronx, vaccination rates are not that different to Alabama and Mississippi. 
And so um, I, I do fear that we're going to see a, an uptick in cases. Um, the personal decision I, I'm going to grapple with at some point is when to pull my kids out of school, um, I suspect. Um, uh, I, I honestly do, don't know what's going to happen. There have been a lot of mitigations put in in schools, but I just can't, can't accurately foresee what will happen. You, New York is, a, is an, a unique environment. This population density with children, parents, and grandparents, it, we, we, we're, doing, we're doing an experiment that is unique, um, unique in nature. And... Um, uh, we will just have to see. And I have to say, I'm a little worried about it. I, yes, I, I share the concern and uh, worry more, uh, even, even more in states in which uh, there are mandates against using masks. Uh, and yes. uh, what are your thoughts, quick thoughts about uh, the utility of masks uh, with a highly infectious virus? Yes, I, I, I mean, the, the data is pretty clear. They're obviously not a, 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 you know, a bulletproof wall against infection, but they clearly statistically shift the rate of infection uh, downward. Um, you know, that there, there are things I'm hearing about the, the UK, for example, that, um, that has had a very mixed, mixed and patchy record, I would say, in controlling the pandemic. And there's been significant evidence there that, that, that school children have been, um, infection rates in school children have been preceding the, the waves that have successively overtaken the UK. There's now, um, I'm not sure about the robustness of these data, but there, there are some of the recent estimates are that somewhere between 40 and 70% of the school children in the UK are, are seropositive. Now, if that those numbers are, well, it's an extraordinarily wide range, which tells us that those children haven't been monitored particularly well, but if those numbers are correct, it puts a lie to, to this notion that schools are not drivers of the, the pandemics in, in developed countries. Um, so, so yes, it, it's just a terrible idea, I think, to, to remove mitigations when you're putting a group of 30 people in a confined space for several hours a day and then repeating that day after day after day. So one of the questions that uh, has come up uh, has uh, been, to what extent are vaccines a zero-sum game? If we go ahead and use boosters uh, uh, here in the U.S., uh, are we denying uh, uh, doses in uh, the third world? Uh, and uh, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts uh, uh, on this. I've been impressed at how rapidly the world has scaled up uh, in the production of uh, all of the efficacious uh, vaccines. As I mentioned, uh, we've, uh, the world has delivered 5.7 billion doses uh, uh, so far this year. Uh, and uh, Pfizer has uh, uh, announced that they'll do on their own three billion doses, deliver three billion doses this year, four billion doses next. Uh, and, I, and, and they're probably the most complex uh, uh, vaccine to uh, uh, manufacture uh, compared to AstraZeneca or uh, some of the inactivated uh, viruses. Your thoughts? Yes, so um, I'm, I'm a virologist, not uh, 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 someone with expertise in logistics or ethics, although I certainly have opinions on the latter. So a, a, a rather compelling argument was made to me the other day is that we, we have to, in the United States, keep, keep enough doses around to vaccinate um, our unvaccinated population while we're trying to persuade them uh, we, we can't not have the doses um, on hand. But currently, there's a situation where those doses are being held, um, but they're expiring because um, the United States population is, uh, at least some fraction of it, is has been uh, less enthusiastic. Now, I would 
I would very much rather those doses go into someone's arm as a third booster shot than than expire on a shelf. A vaccine that expires on a shelf is is by far the worst use of a vaccine. Um, you know, obviously, ultimately, we have to get as much immunity into the population on a global scale as as we can. Um, but I don't I don't see this so much as an either or. Um, um, I'm actually quite enthusiastic about um, putting boosters into the U.S. population uh, at the in the near future. So given uh, uh, all that you've predicted uh, about the variants that would emerge, um, I trust your judgment a lot on uh, your ability to uh, look at the variants that are on the horizon and judge whether these are likely uh, to be successors uh, to Delta or not. Uh, so the, uh, the, you know, the kids in the wing uh, uh, currently seem to be uh, Lambda and Mu, and Mu is uh, particularly interesting because it has, in addition to uh, some of the variants in Delta, uh, has also this uh, E484K mutation, which knocks out uh, one of the uh, epitopes uh, uh, fairly effectively for antibody binding. So do you see any of these as uh, being worthy competitors? So, so I, I should, should, um, should downplay our ability to predict um, the future. Um, I think what, what we have been able to do is, is say retrospectively, oh, that amino acid change that appeared in that variant, we saw that as an antibody resistant mutation six months ago. And if we'd been brave enough then we could have predicted that, that that would have appeared in nature. What's, what's the case, though, is that each of these variants have different subsets of mutations. Um, and it, it, it is, does seem to be the case that um, the successful variants are the ones that combine them in ways that we're actually not very good at predicting at this point. So. Um, for example, um, the alpha variant a few months ago was tearing throughout the world. Um, and then a derivative of it with the E484K mutation appeared in England. And that looked like that would be a problem. That would have um, many of the properties that we now see in Delta, we would predict. But of course, that, that virus didn't didn't rise to prominence there. Something else came out of left field, um, built up a huge population in India, um, and then disseminated to the rest of the world. So I, I'm afraid I have to be very circumspect about um, what, what I see for the future. One thing that is, that is biologically very interesting and also has significant um, policy implications uh, for trying to predict how to adjust the vaccines going forward is to what extent Delta has squeezed out everything else, okay? If the next variant on the block is a derivative of Delta, then it would behove us now to make Delta-based vaccines to deal with that, that family of variants. Um, we could have asked the same question a few months ago about Alpha, if a derivative of Alpha had been the next variant, then it would have made sense to make alpha derived um, vaccine variant. But of course, Delta came from somewhere else on the tree. So we're, we're still, we still haven't reached that sort of um, state of equilibrium that I think we will eventually reach when there's widespread immunity throughout the world and each new variant displaces the previous one. Right now, we still have too many branches on the tree that are still active that haven't been squeezed out. Um, and so the, the next variant, mu or lambda, or there's one I just heard about yesterday, AY33, um, some of them are coming from other places on the tree. Uh, the most recent one I've heard about is a derivative um, of delta. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't put my hand on my heart and say that's where the next one's coming from because the chances of me being wrong are high. But at some point, we are going to have to deal with that issue as we 
try to update vaccines over the long term. So one of uh, our attendees uh, heard you talk about uh, the antibodies evolving to bind tighter to the original sequence uh, and points out that the original sequence shouldn't be there anymore long after uh, the virus has been fought off. So how are they achieving uh, this remarkable convergence on tighter binding antibodies? Right. Well, there's, there's perhaps two things going on, and we're not quite sure the extent to which they apply. So um, one of the papers that we published with Michelle um, earlier this year or late last year, um, in collaboration with investigators at um, Mount Sinai, actually, we think that the virus actually sticks around um, in uh, more, more, I guess, remote sites in the body a little longer than than we think. So, our colleague at Mount Sinai, Saurabh Mahandri, was he could take gut biopsies months after the virus had been cleared from the respiratory tract and find occasional um, infected cells. So, so what that means immunologically is that there, there are, in at least a subset of people, viral antigens, proteins that persist. Um, that can be true even if the virus isn't replicating, but it, it's more likely to be true if there is low level replication going on for some time after the virus is, is cleared in the sense that you become PCR negative and resume your life. We suspect that that's at least part of it the, that's driving this antibody maturation. We, have, we don't have such a good idea about how long the viral protein sticks around after people have been mRNA vaccinated. Um, it's likely to hang around for longer than it's easy to detect and still having an effect on the immune system. Um, other investigators have found um, what's called germinal centers still active um, many weeks after uh, original vaccination, suggesting that the, the spike protein lingers and educates the immune system for longer than, than you might think. Is there precedent for that with other uh, viruses? Well, well, every virus is different. So, so HIV is a persistent virus, for example, is constantly re-educating the immune system and the immune system essentially can't keep up. And, and the levels of, of um, maturation, the mutation that happen in uh, antibody genes in HIV uh, infection is enormous. Um, there are you know, other viruses, um, um, let's pluck one off the shelf, something like a dengue virus, for example, that is thought to be cleared quite quickly, but there's, there's a suspicion that um, viral proteins linger um, and continue to stimulate the immune system. Um, it's actually something that's really quite difficult to study, distinguishing between low-level persistent infection and just lingering fragments of virus. It, it's hard to know because they're, they're quite they're at very low levels and hard to measure in people who have been infected. Paul, as a last question, uh, we talked, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, briefly the potentials for a couple of different types of uh, uh, therapeutic approaches, namely uh, bispecific uh, antibodies uh, as one, uh, the use uh, of uh, the nanobodies to try to identify uh, other epitopes, and then the question of uh, whether IgA-based uh, antibodies uh, could provide the mucosal immunity to prevent uh, uh, primary infection. Uh, do you have thoughts about uh, uh, paths forward for uh, any of these? So, so yes, in the sense that it, I think the path forward is perhaps more most straightforward for bispecific antibodies based on IgG because that's a, a conceptually relatively straightforward uh, engineering um, problem. Um, the nanobodies are um, exciting potential therapies because they're so small, they can perhaps be in inhaled and get right to the site uh, where, they, where they need to work. Uh, I must confess I'm not up completely up to date about where those 
where those clinical experiments or even preclinical experiments are. So those are things I think that have potential that that hasn't um, uh, yet been realized. Um, the IGA is yes, that's that's a, that's something that perhaps we should have been prepared for and weren't. Um, and it's really just because the manufacturing platforms are set up for, for IgG. There isn't, as far as I know, any principle that would, would prevent one from, from um, manufacturing Ig and, IgA antibodies, um, injecting them and having them preferentially traffic to um, mucosal surfaces and therefore giving perhaps... Um, better protection. Um, IgA has the advantage, of course, that it can be a, a dimer, so you get four four binding sites for the virus on on a on a single molecule. One shouldn't shouldn't um, poo poo the IgG too much though, because there's plenty of IgG in in mucosal secretions. It's just that the IgA is a, it is it is at higher higher concentrations, um, and it wouldn't be a night and day difference in efficacy, but you might have greater potency if you were were able to administer administer IgA. Um, but having said that, the the monoclonal antibodies have been one of the success stories of of the of the pandemics thus far. So I, I lied and neglected to uh, ask uh, one question that uh, several readers uh, uh, of our audience members uh, came up with uh, uh, regarding the J&J uh, &J, uh, or the um, AstraZeneca uh, vaccines that uh, are based on uh, adenovirus uh, and uh, related uh, viruses uh, regarding uh, a uh, do you think boosters uh, will be useful uh, for those viruses given you're reintroducing uh, the same adenovirus? Uh, and B, uh, is, you know, is the J&J &J vaccine, which hasn't been used uh, so much in the United States uh, compared to uh, the mRNA uh, vaccines, uh, is, is, should they get boosted with, you think, with J&J uh, &J or will an mRNA boost uh, to a and j vaccine be uh, acceptable or preferable? Um, good question. And I don't think I can give a definitive answer at present. My prediction would be that an mRNA boost would be preferable given the the theoretical possibility that vector immunity um, um, would uh, suppress the the efficacy of a, a second or third shot of an of a of an adenovirus. Um, that might be, I think, particularly the case with people who have had AstraZeneca, where they've already had two shots. Perhaps less of an issue with J and J. And I believe there's a trial approaching completion with two shots of, of J and J. The the notion of using of putting an mRNA after a J and J shot that that is is being studied, um, not not specifically by us but by by other groups. So those those um, things will those pieces of information will should become available um, soon. Um, in the meantime, I would be hesitant about giving anybody specific medical advice other than to say if it were me, I'd have an mRNA. <laughs> Well, with those words, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, a, a, an enlightening uh, discussion, as uh, always. Um, given the time, I think we should close the discussion now. I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, answer uh, all of the questions, but uh, we will try to uh, respond to as many as we can uh, offline. Uh, thank you, Paul, for joining us today. For those of you who uh, joined us uh, for these virtual discussions, we'll continue to keep informed in the coming months, uh, and your philanthropic support uh, has been and will continue to be vital to the success of our efforts uh, to combat uh, COVID-19. Thank you again for participating today, and have a good evening. <music>